Here are the words from St. Matthew. The first chapter, the 24th verse, and the 25th. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and he took his wife. But he knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. So now, what would you say drives what you do every day? Would you say, what fills your life are the agreements that have been made? Or is it driven by love? If you think about it for a moment, you might argue that you just go wherever your heart desires. You go to your favorite job, you come home to the, your favorite people, then you do your favorite things, perhaps on the weekend. But then, aren't many arrangements made to make sure that those things are in place? Such as how much you're getting paid to do the job, to make sure that you stay faithful to the person you are with. And that there are designated areas or times to do those things that you love. Perhaps the answer to this question is both love and agreements <coughs> fill up the days of our lives. You have chosen what you wanted to do and you have our agreements made to embrace the days ahead of you. However, as I put these thoughts together, I do find it interesting that marriage itself has become a less popular choice. People would rather live with whoever they want, and if they don't want to be with that person anymore, then they can just get up and walk away. To me, it sounds a little bit more of a stressful way to live, not only for the person walking away, but also for those who are dependent upon that person. But nevertheless, people have reasons for doing what they do. In our gospel lesson, we have Mary and Joseph, who are well on their way to begin their life together as a married couple. They are looking forward to working together to build up their home and live independently from their parents. And they're about to have a family of their own. They're ready to love each other. And they are a God-fearing couple. Good people who knew that if either of them are going to break off their relationship, they're not only going to have faced major consequences by their spouse, but they are also going to have to face major consequences by their community. So long story short, this agreement for them to live as a married couple is a big deal. Well, as our scripture says, before they were ready to have kids, Mary is pregnant by the Holy Spirit. That's what it says. Now, Joseph is probably thinking the same questions you might have thought. How can this be? This is a lovely Jewish girl, and she has already a child before Joseph has his way with her. Who then is the father? Has Mary betrayed Joseph? Who is the man that laid with Mary? For how does a woman get pregnant without another man? How does the Holy Spirit impregnate a woman? Well, now, Joseph seems to think that instead of trying to figure out how this agreement with Mary has already been broken, 
And instead of trying to punish whoever caused this infidelity, he thinks to himself, he'd rather just try to break off the relationship with her and just try to start over somewhere else. This way, at least, Mary has a chance of being with the person who she really wants to be with. Well, before Joseph leaves, an angel comes to Joseph in a dream, basically saying, don't leave. Yes, you have been loyal to your wife, and yes, you are a good, God-fearing Jew, but Mary has indeed been impregnated by the Holy Spirit. This child will be a son, and his name shall be Jesus. And his job is to save people from their sins. This is basically the message the angel gave. So not only has Mary told Joseph that this pregnancy is a part of God's plan, but now an angel is also saying that this pregnancy is also a part of God's plan. So what will the neighbors think of Mary and Joseph? How is their household going to look with this God-given child in their house? With this child who was there before the proper time it takes to prepare for a Jewish family? Well, if God is doing this, then God must have a plan. If it's his plan, then it has to be set up for everything to work out. And if God can create this planet out of nothing, then I'm sure somehow God can place a baby inside of a womb. And our gospel writer also says that a long time ago, God even planned for a virgin woman to bear a son and give birth to Jesus. So Joseph, out of his guidance given from the Lord, he doesn't leave Mary. He stays with her. And they raise Jesus as their own. So how does this passage give us guidance about love and agreements? Well, how did Joseph respond in the end? Did he follow his heart? Or did he follow what God told him to do? How the Jews understand God is that since he is their deliverer and rescuer, they ought to live by what God tells them to do. Or else there will be consequences. God has made an agreement with them, and an agreement that is more contractual than living off of personal desires or living for the sake of good feelings. Now, do our, we ourselves think of interacting with God in this way? Do we think of God inter interacting with us in this way? Or about what about our own lives with other people? Do we interact with people in this way? Maybe yes and, and maybe no. And in some ways, how you interact with others depends on the person or the trends of the generation. Now, what did you all think about the Old Testament lesson for today? Was it something you wanted to hang on your wall? What about our epistle reading? Would you rather have those words on your wall? Maybe you already do. As it says from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, love is patient and kind. 
Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things, and endures all things. And love never ends. Now these things sound attractive, don't they? They are characteristics of a person you want to be around. But do we always live this way? Do we ever get irritated? Do we hope in all things? Do we really want to keep going when life gets difficult? Do we re rejoice in truth? Do we really want to embrace the Ten Commandments that God gives us? The Ten Commandments that set us to embrace, set up, set us up to embrace to what, what is good? The commandments that are loving, even though it might mean that we might have to take a loss if we follow them, even though it might mean we have to go through some hard times. The Old Testament passage in Nehemiah gives us a history lesson and how God's own people, the Israelites, treated him. In fact, the whole chapter is about the history of God's relationship with his people. But I only chose a small portion of it so that you just have enough to get the idea of what God's relationship with his people looked like. God delivered his people from slavery in Egypt, for they were God's favored people from Abraham. He gave them a land that he told them was for them, even though it was occupied by those who did not worship him. And though the Israelites did not follow through the first opportunity to claim that land, they followed through when they received a second opportunity from God. Now, while they were in the promised land, the people were definitely blessed there. They were set up to live well, and the people multiplied in number to resemble the number of stars in the sky. They lived so well that you could say that they were fat and happy. That's what the scripture says. But then the people became excessively disobedient over time that they refused to follow God's law. They would even go as far as killing the prophets, God's messengers for correcting them, for telling them to repent and turn from their wicked ways. The people didn't want to hear what God had to say. So as a result, God let the neighboring enemies do whatever they wished with his people. Even if it meant doing, thing, some, doing things that were perhaps even unimaginable. Things you just wouldn't want to even talk about. And God let this be his punishment for his people. But when God's chosen people cried out for help, what did God do? Did he ignore their cry? Had he had enough of his people that he cut them off forever? No. He heard their cry. No, he didn't deliver them from their suffering right away. In fact, he waited till the next generation for them to have a chance as living as his people. Uh, and back in the homeland. Out of his great mercies, he had set up leaders to make a way for his people to return to the promised land. Do 
So let me ask you, could you do what God did? Would you rescue someone who killed a close friend of yours? Would you bless a person that took your resources and exploited them for their own purposes? Would you save someone who perhaps maybe even cursed your name? Would you save someone who sinned against you? And that's what God did. Yes, there was a punishment given before the saving, but still God chose to rescue his people. He chose to rescue them while they were weak and helpless. Why? It's because of who God is. It's out of his love for his people. The Hebrew word is said. It's out of his steadfast love, his contract with his people, his abundant grace and his mercy and forgiveness for his people. Out of his head, he brings those who were once his enemies to become his people. Even when you read the readings of the minor prophets in, in the Bible, where it just lists page after page of all the terrible things that God's people had done. There's still a few verses in there where there are some people where he hears God's, where he where God hears their plea for help. And this plea sounds something like, I know I've been a complete disgusting selfish jerk. And I know there's no reason why I deserve to have a good relationship with you. But you promised, you made an agreement that you would be my God. So today, I worship you with a repentant heart, with a heart sorry for what I've done, so that you make me your people once again. Save me and I will worship you. And out of God's love, he rescues his people. So now, how does our passage in Matthew reflect God's love? Well, not only does it show that both Mary and Joseph love God by following his commandments, even if it wasn't something they were originally had desired in their heart. But it's even more so a reflection of what God himself did for his people. He gave the people who had a broken history of being unfaithful to him, and he followed through his promises. He finally gave them a savior the one who would rescue them from their sins once and for all by dying on the cross, even by the very own people who were rejecting him at the time. And the good book tells us that this Jesus isn't just for the Jews. It's also for us Gentiles, those who aren't Jews. For whoever believes in Jesus shall not perish in their sin and death, but be rescued to live eternally with this loving God. So as God so loved us that he gave us Jesus to die for our sins, our sins that are against him, let us believe in Jesus. Let us have faith in the one who has kept his promises, including giving us a son, the one who came to save us. And as we are redeemed and loved by him, let us seek to love like him, to be full of grace and mercy, to love those who are difficult to love, because when God's will is at work, good and amazing things 
will happen. They will happen beyond whatever we could have imagined that it would turn out by our own understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. At this time, we now collect a offering.